former heads of Britain's intelligence agencies, as you've just been hearing, have warned leaving the EU would pose a security risk. Writing in the Sunday Times, the former leaders of MI5 and MI6 say a vote for Brexit could undermine what they describe as our ability to protect ourselves from terrorists. Well, the Shadow Defence Secretary, Emily Thornbury, is with me now. And a very good morning to you. Your reaction mm. to that, uh, do you go uh, along with these, I mean, esteemed former heads of uh, our two main intelligence agencies? I think that we should take very seriously what people who have no political axe to grind have to say on this, and they are experts on it. Um, and so, yes, I think this is, I think that one of the major reasons for remaining in the European Union is in order to ensure that we safeguard our security. I think our ability to be able to exchange information and to be able to work with allies is very important indeed. OK, so that endorsed. Now, let, let's stay with the issue of security. And uh, Sadiq Khan, of course, uh, elected as the, the new mayor of London. Uh, I mean, do you believe, as uh, some of the Conservative side has said, that uh, London is a, a less safe city as a result? I think that Michael Fallon, particularly my, my opposite number, has made the most outrageous claims about, about Sadiq Khan, and I think that he should take them back. I think it's an insult. Um, and I'm very angry about it. I'm very angry about the way in which they ran this campaign. I think they tried to divide London, and frankly, London came back with a resounding answer, which is we are a multiracial, multicultural city, and we're proud of it. We like it that way. We're not going to have anybody divide us. So, dog whistle, the, the Donald Trump playbook, it's been turned. I think that's absolutely right. I think that's absolutely what it was. And I think they shouldn't be forgiven. I think they should apologise. And I think we should never see anything like that again. And, you know, I think it is fantastic to have seen Sadiq elected with such a resounding victory on Thursday. And also, look at Bristol. I mean, Bristol, where we have an Afro-Caribbean mayor now who doubled his vote from four years ago. It's... it's Amazing. Mm. It's such good news. Well, I mean, let, let, let's talk about Bristol and London because, uh, you know, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, your leader, of course, uh, went, went to Bristol to, to celebrate that event as Sadiq Khan was being uh, sworn in, in in London. Do you think there's a bit of a rift between the two? Well, what can you do? You know, go and win two mayoralties in the way that we did on the same night. You can't be in two places at once. Um, so he went down to Bristol because I think actually there's not been a lot of attention paid to Bristol, but it is an extraordinary result in Bristol to have doubled the number of votes in four years. I mean, it is really showing a difference. People keep saying that Labour can't win in the South East. Well, hey, you know, we have had a fantastic result in Bristol, a fantastic result in London. We've had great results in Exeter, in Southampton, okay. you know. Some of the major conurbations. Yeah. OK, but on the issue of Sadiq Khan, he hasn't taken long to distance himself, has he? from Jeremy Corbyn. Corbynistas, uh, as they called her, tweeting this morning saying, well, we supported him throughout his campaign and uh, now he says all this about big tents, we've got to be a centrist party, we've got to appeal to people who voted Conservative, we've got to tell people who we want to come back to vote for us that uh, the economy is safe in our hands. Well, who would disagree with that? Of course we've got to be a big tent and of course we've got to appeal to everybody. You think Jeremy we've Corbyn's got to doing be a... that? Of course that's right. Jeremy wouldn't disagree with that? You know, we need to make sure that we, that we stop talking amongst ourselves, about ourselves and gazing at our navels. And we need to be able to get out there and fight some elections and speak to people about issues that matter. You know, Sadiq was absolutely right to talk about housing. You know, guess what? Jeremy Corbyn's last question at Prime Minister's Questions was about housing. Did David Cameron answer it? No. David Cameron wanted to talk about Islamophobia. You know, we had the answers on issues that people were interested in. That's why we have done as well as we have done in many of the places that we have. So you're saying Jeremy Corbyn runs this, this big tent, it's one nation that he can appeal, and you must know the, the statistics that you're faced with after the overall election results, particularly in Scotland, that Labour, yeah. to win the next general election, has to achieve a 13% swing in England. That's not likely to happen at the moment. I mean, it's, I'm not saying that it's not going to be hard, but, you know, let's also put, let's also put on the table the other facts. So, you know, so, so we did 4% better than we did in the general election. So we are going in the right direction. Of course, Scotland is a big issue. No one's going to pretend that we don't have big problems in Scotland. But I'll tell you, where we have got to in Scotland now is the SNP have got devolved all the powers that they need. They are now the establishment in Scotland. If things go wrong in Scotland, it is their fault. There are no more excuses. You know, falling results in the schools need the people need to put, point the finger at the Scots Nats. And I think there will come a time when we need to be able to build our fight back. You know, there was a time, wasn't there, when Boris Johnson won the second mayoralty in London. People were saying, oh, Labour's never going to win this again and so on. Well, we did. And we show that we can. You can fight back. We have 
we have ups and downs. And in, and in, and in London, we're currently on an up, but in, in Scotland, we've clearly got a long way to go. How um, eagerly are Labour going to uh, fight for Britain to remain within the European Union? We're reading today that uh, Jeremy Corbyn, who we were expecting to rail in four square now behind the campaign, he's taking a 10-day holiday towards uh, the, the end of the campaign before the vote. Well, I mean, I think it's been pretty full on for Jeremy, hasn't it, since he was elected as leader. I do think that when Parliament's not sitting, he should be allowed to have a few days off. Uh, we, are, we'll, we will be campaigning full out to stay in Europe. You know, Labour is a united party on this issue, and we will be speaking with one voice. It is a team effort, and for Jeremy to have a few days off, I don't think is something that anyone should begrudge. Before one of the most important decisions facing the entirety of the United Kingdom. And he's going to be campaigning on the, on the issue, and he's going to be going up and down the country, as he has been throughout these local council elections. You know, he will be doing it, and so will I, and so will the rest of the party. It's really important that we stay in Europe. OK, just want to ask you about, we were discussing Islamophobia uh, earlier, weren't we, the accusations of that. What about uh, Ken Livingston? Man, you know well, a mm. friend of yours, isn't he, Ken mm. Livingston, really? Um, you know, that whole anti-Semitism row. I was talking to him as, as well after the elections on Friday and he was at it again. Do you think he's got a point, though? He clearly thinks it's very important to make that, that point about the alleged link, he says, between Hitler and Zionism. No, I don't. No, I don't. I think that... Jewish people have played a really important role in the development of the Labour Party. They have played a really important role on the left. And I think that we have to make it perfectly clear that they are central to the Labour Party and remain central to the Labour Party. And I think that any examples of, of anti-Semitism have to be rooted out. And I'm really pleased that Shami Chakrabarti has taken the role that she has. Well, Sadiq Khan's saying he feels that uh, Labour didn't act quickly enough on it. Did, do you agree with that? Well, I mean, I think it took a couple of days, but, you know, we've done it. And we've set up this inquiry and we've set it up under somebody who's universally respected. Mm. But you've still got uh, Ken Livingston. Ken Livingston uh, could be back in the party. He's, he's suspended, as I say, he was at it again. Do you think historically, I mean, he says it's historical fact. There will be an inquiry. Ken can say what he has to say to the NEC and a decision will be made. Right. Now, Ken Livingston has also been, and we talked about this before, hasn't he, involved in uh, the Trident review or not, or he's certainly had a few thoughts about Trident. Where are we with Labour's review about uh, the renewal, the replacement of Trident? I'm doing a defence review, as, as is Labour Party policy. So Labour Party policy is that there is to be a review. So when I was given the job, I was given the job of doing a review of all of defence. That means looking at the 21st century threats to Britain and how we keep Britain safe. Because of all jobs that politicians have, we have to keep our people safe above everything else. As part of that, I'm doing a review into whether or not we should be in favour of the renewal of the Trident submarines. That is only a part of it, but it is certainly part of it. And I appreciate right. that when I come out with my review, the only bit that people are likely to read will be the bit on Trident. Yeah, well, because, uh, but I'm, you know, thousands I'm doing of a, jobs and billions of billions of pounds I'm doing to be, a, to be I'm doing a, an interim report, which, is, which I'm hoping to, to release at the end of May, but that's only an interim, and that's then going to feed into the national policy-making process of the Labour Party. But you've given some, uh, some intriguing... Uh, um, I suppose, pointers as to the way you're thinking. Do you still believe that technology is developing so fast that submarines may become more or less obsolete because they will become easier to detect? I think that we have to, as part of the review, look at whether or not these boats will be out of date by, by the time they hit the water in the 2030s and whether they will still be cutting-edge technologies by the 2060s because we want to. This will be the single biggest investment this government will make in anything. And for heaven's sake, we want to make sure that it is as effective as it possibly can be. So it is right to ask these questions. There are problems, you know, I think, on the horizon in that you know, billions of pounds are being invested in anti-submarine technology. We need to be confident that if we do buy this new system, that it will still be able to hide in opaque seas. We also have to look at there is a series of other threats. But didn't you say it was like trying to patrol the sky with uh, with Spitfires? I mean, you're more no, or less I, you're no, more no. or less convinced that yeah, they no. will become. What I was okay. saying was that was that we have. In the defence industry, you talk about platforms. So you talk about, you know, we'll have this particular type of ship. It won't get out of date because we can bolt on this and we can add this. I was talking about the tornadoes, which are actually relatively elderly um, planes, and they are as elderly as, as if we oh. had Spitfires over the, over, the, over the shores in the 1980s. But the tornadoes could be absolutely cutting-edge technology by adding things to it. The question is, will the platform... Will hiding very large submarines in the sea still work right. in the 2060s? Now, I know as, as part of this um, uh, review, you, uh, you got in con 
confusion about uh, the DEFCON levels, the defence condition levels. You've now got Damien McBride advising you. I've read his book. He's very good at uh, prepping his charges, as he says, with all the essential information they should have. So now, no doubt you've got your DEFCON levels as uh, potential uh, Secretary of State for Defence sorted out. So DEFCON 1 is... So the Daily Mail, in fact, wrote out, had a little, had yeah, a little card it? that I was supposed to keep in my handbag. The point I was trying to make... Well, well, was what was that? Hang on, hang on. Let, let, me, let me just make this point. The point I was trying to make was some people say that we should have continual at-sea nuclear deterrence. So the, so the ship should be... So the, so the submarine should be out at all times, right? Because if we were to... If mm. there was to be a time of heightened tension and we were to suddenly have another submarine go out, then that would in turn spiral out attention. The point I'm making is that there are publicly acknowledged and indeed publicised states of readiness yes. in, in the United States. And so, and so you know... And so do you know what they are? Do you know what they equate to? <sighs> what is DEFCON 1? So DEFCON 1 is the, is the absolute, you know, we are about to go. Imminence of nuclear yeah. war. DEFCON 2, which uh, the world has uh, been at, the United States have been at that level twice. Do you yes. know what DEFCON 2 is? It is the stage below it. So <laughs> yes, it would be. Yeah, very good. <laughs> the finger is not above, but, not, but not, there not, is not official not definition. The, no, I don't know the official definition of DEFCON one, or DEFCON two, which is the Americans' second stage of nuclear yeah, readiness. It's armed forces at six hours ready to deploy. And do you know uh, when? If when I was Secretary American... of State, well, if would, I was Secretary of State for, in sure. the United States, then I'm sure that it would be important for me to know all the niceties of this. The important well, it would thing be very important we if don't you were have... Secretary of State for Defence here, and you had control of our nuclear weapons. Yes, and and the point that I'm making is whether or not you should have submarines continually at sea or not, or whether you can instead release a submarine if you or launch a submarine if you need to, if the tension gets But you gets still don't greater. know all your DEFCON levels. I can't tell you what DEFCON 4 is. <laughs> OK, or 3? Stop it, damn it, honestly. <laughs> well, it is important, isn't it? I mean, it, would you not accept it's very important? If you had to take the yeah. mission to DEFCON level 3... And you don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that um, I'm sure that it's what. But but this morning on a Sunday morning after the elections, I can't tell you off the top of my head. But what I can do is I can tell you that if that when I am Secretary of State for Defence, you'll know it. I will know it. And you I will, will certainly know it probably that. within about twenty minutes now, because Damien McBride is going to take your side <laughs> and read these and learn. Or everything. keep or keep the Daily Mail in my handbag at all times. I'm sure you do. Anyway. I'm sure that's what I always ought to do. Listen, that's Shadow Secretary of State. Thank you very much indeed. Very good to see you. Nice to see you too.